now. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of No. 
you had a good Thanksgiving this past week regardless of where you were or how different it looked from a usual year. It is a joy to welcome you to our online service here on Facebook and YouTube today and I'm so glad that we can gather for worship on this first Sunday of Advent. Well during this church season we are awaiting the coming of the Christ child. These four Sundays that lead up to Christmas remind us that we are also in a season of waiting for Jesus to come again. Today we're going to begin by diving into this theme of waiting and we'll hear scripture from Luke 1 and Micah 7. Also, just a reminder that next Sunday we will celebrate communion in our homes during our service, so plan to gather some bread and crackers and juice or wine before our time together next week. As Bjorn announced last week, worship for Advent and Christmas will be online only. As a staff and leadership team, we discern together that this would be the wisest way to gather at this time. Our hearts grieve that we will not be able to meet in person during this sacred time, and yet we recognize that this is really the best way to move forward in light of our current situation. So please carve time out in your week to hear from God's word and to worship with us, and we'll plan to meet at 9.30 every Sunday morning, um, as has been our online pattern. Kids, we want you to be a part of online kids ministry as well. There are some really fun videos that are available beginning each Saturday morning to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Parents, you can find really simple activities to do with your kids on our website at thewhychurch.org slash children, along with some Advent resources. Today is our last week in our series on gratitude for the month of November, and next week we will be in a new series called Simply Christmas, No Assembly Required. Students, we will meet online this Wednesday night, and it will be our last one before we take a break for Christmas. Middle and high school students will both be on Zoom, and we will celebrate Christmas in a home but not alone kind of way. And I hope you will join us at 6.30 p.m. for our time together. We also care deeply about the kids and students in our community. And this Christmas season, we have two ways that you can help locally. One is by donating gifts to a Lincoln Elementary family and another by giving gifts to Gifts Anonymous, which is a local organization that provides toys for kids in the Elk River Otsego area. 
You can find details about these in our e-bulletin and also on thewhychurch.org slash outreach. Prayer is a vital part of our life together, and we would love to pray specifically for you, whether it's a praise report or prayer request, please feel free to email prayer at thewhychurch.org. You can also call 763-250-9504 for pastoral care at any time. If there's anything going on that we can help with or just listen and pray with you, we would love to do that. I want to say thank you to those of you who were able to attend our annual meeting last weekend or for those who are able to vote ahead of time. The budget for 2021 was unanimously approved, as were the three incoming leadership team members who are JC Tiki, Laura Holscher, and Ryan Vick. The continuation of our ministry and the support of our budget is due to God's faithfulness and your generosity as you follow his leading in this area of your life. We are so grateful for the ways that you continue to give as we utilize your gifts to continue our mission of seeking Jesus, connecting together, and sharing his love. There are a few different ways you can give financially to the Y Church. You can give online. There's also a mobile giving option by texting YGIVE to 77977 and you can mail your offerings in as well. And finally, before I turn it over to John for worship and our beginner Bible reading, I wanna take a moment to say thank you to the Y Church family. This is my last Sunday on staff at the Y Church and I am so grateful for the time that I've had to be with you. Students and kids, I will miss laughing and playing games and seeing you grow in your walk with Jesus. Parents, I will miss your support, your prayers, your texts, and your friendship. And to each of you, you have been such an encouragement to me both personally and professionally with your notes and phone calls and simply allowing me to be a part of what God is doing in your lives. I'm reminded of the words that Paul shares in Colossians 1. He writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. As I get ready to make the transition from youth ministry to motherhood, I know that God has used my time at the Y Church to prepare me for what's next. Your continued prayers for our family as we step into this next part of our journey are so appreciated, as are the prayers for this next person who will step into the role of Director of Student and Family Ministry at the Y Church. God really has great plans in store. And now, Will you join me as we worship through song together? Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, it's the first week of Advent, and traditionally at the Y Church, we would ease ourselves into Christmas music and maybe only do a couple songs the first week. Um, but given what this year has brought to us, I thought it would be beneficial for us to just get started right with some Christmas music and get us into that spirit. So would you join me as we do a couple songs to start our morning?
Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. She had never seen an angel before. Gabriel said, Don't be afraid. You are very special to God. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must name him Jesus. He will be called the Son of the Most High God. Mary asked, How can it be so? I am not married. Gabriel answered, With God, all things are possible. Mary said, I love God. I will do what he has chosen me to do. Good morning, everybody. This is Bjorn. Happy first Sunday in Advent. Uh, thanks, Ava, for reading our Beginner's Bible reading this morning and getting us into the Christmas story. Great to have you leading in worship in that way. And I did catch a glimpse of that nice Christmas tree that you had behind you. Really fun to see that. Uh, that's where I've stationed myself here, too, in the living room. And uh, it's great to be in worship together this morning. We're going to do our kids' blessing next. And here, uh, still in November, we're finishing up with this November kids' blessing from Psalm 136. And uh, if you would join me in these words and speaking them over someone there in your home that you would like to bless, uh, especially our kids, love to use this blessing over them. Uh, you'll be able to fill in the blank with a name and personalize this blessing as it appears on the screen. And we say these words together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love 
lasts forever. Amen. That's a great blessing. We'll have a new one now starting next Sunday as we uh, will officially be in December next week. Uh, we are very thankful today for our wonderful friend and sister in Christ, Megan Peterson. And it is just one of those realities where we could not be happier for Megan and Jeff and what it means to step into parenthood and welcome this new little one. And we are 100% supportive too of, of Megan just being at home and shifting gears and being a, a full-time mom at home. And at the same time, uh, we're sad because we're gonna, miss, we're gonna miss Megan and Jeff dearly. They have been such an integral part of our ministry life these past two plus years. We have all kinds of wonderful memories. And in fact, we put a few of those together for you. And uh, we wanna share a, a little video over the next few minutes that includes some video thank yous from households across the Y Church, as well as some picture highlights. So we hope you enjoy. Hey Megan, it's Jacob Palm. I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done for the Y Church and for Kids Ministry. Andrew Palm. Hi, I'm Kathy Palm. Megan, thank you for your years at the Y Church. I'll always remember the message you gave at Jacob's baccalaureate service. It will just hold a special place in my heart. And thank you for making Wednesday nights fun. Thank you, Megan. You've always made Wednesdays be fun. We will miss you. Thank you, Megan. Megan for all the Bible readings and fun games and helping me learn more about Jesus in the past few years. Thank you, Megan, for all the fun games at Youth Group and you've just built my relationship with God and Jesus. Um, I hope you have fun with your baby and we'll miss you. Thank you, Megan. Megan, it has been a privilege to serve with you these last couple of years. Thank you so very much. Hi, Megan. Thank you for being our youth group leader. I've learned so much in youth group and church. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I hope, I hope we'll see you at Camp Shamana. It has been such a pleasure to serve together the last few years at Wildlife. Your leadership and your friendship have meant so much to so many of us. We know this is an amazing opportunity to stay home with your little one, but we are sure going to miss you. Thank you again, Megan. Thank you, Megan, for taking me to Caribou. Hey Megan, on behalf of my family, we just thank you for touching our lives and blessing us in ways that you probably don't even realize for the last two years. Thank you for asking me to be a youth group leader to enrich my life in ways that I never thought possible. We're going to miss you. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Megan. I'll miss you. Hi, Megan. It's Lori and... Garrett. <laughs> and we just want to say thank you for all that you do for our kids and kids ministry and guiding them through a relationship with Jesus. And we just wish you all the best in your next adventure. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Hi, Megan. Um, we will miss you from church. And um, thank you for teaching us about Jesus. And thank you for being our teacher. And I wish you and your baby and your husband a happy life. Hi, Megan. Uh, thank you for uh, teaching us the gospel for the past two years. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. For Kids Ministry!
thank you for teaching Bible study and that that we and I like doing the crate with you and that we could have some fun time. Thank you, Megan, for being a wonderful leader and a blessing to student ministry. Thank you, Megan. I'll always remember all the times we went to Starbucks together. Hi, Megan. I only have 15 seconds, and there aren't words that I can fit in 15 seconds to say what you've meant to me personally and to the Y Church as our leader. You have amazed me in the way that you've led with such love for these children through everything that they've been through. I am so grateful to be, have been able to walk alongside you, and I look so forward to seeing what God does with you in your new adventures. God bless you. Thank you, Megan. Megan, for everything that you've done and being a great leader. Thank you, Megan, for everything you do. We miss spending lunch with you. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Megan. Scott. Sherry. Sarah. And Matt. We'd like to thank you for organizing the London trip and for all you've done for student ministry. Thank, thank you. We enjoyed Wednesday nights. They were really fun. Thank, thank you, Megan. We'll miss you. Well, thank you to all those who sent in a little clip and participated in this uh, fun way to say goodbye to Megan. Also meaningful, and maybe we're wiping away a tear or two, and we don't blame you one bit for that. We're going to miss Megan. Uh, if I can speak personally just for a second, I'm going to miss Megan's preaching. She has uh, so richly blessed our body by her gift in preaching, a God-given gift um, that I trust will continue to bear fruit over the years to come. Secondly, I'm gonna miss the way that she connects so naturally with students and kids and, and their parents and adults. Uh, just really such a, a genuine, personable nature that Megan has. And that really is, is where I'd finish with, with my little list of three, is I remember when we interviewed Megan uh, two and a half years ago, and our personnel uh, panel in that interview, reflecting afterwards and saying, you know, she just, just has such a love for Jesus that is so evident and just, just kind of bubbles out of her. And we continue to see that in Megan. And, um, and we'll miss all of those things, but release her with, with joy and uh, with our blessing. We do have a gift, a farewell gift, that um, a couple of folks from our personnel team selected, handpicked for Megan, that we'll be delivering to her this week. Uh, she does have one more night with our students on Wednesday night and then Thursday will be Megan's last official day on the staff of the Y Church. So Megan and Jeff, we love you and you go with our prayers. And yes, we will share a baby picture once that little one arrives in mid-December. All right, well, now it's time for our table question. And our question that you're gonna have a, just a couple minutes here to dialogue about at home um, or drop in your response to the Facebook comments window there is going to be this today. As we begin the holidays this year, what is something that you are waiting for? We're going to respond to that. Um, maybe get up and grab a, a second cup of coffee, whatever you need there at home, answer that question. And then we're going to go over to Mark Maycumber to his house for our scripture reading.
Good morning, everybody. Um, our scripture reading today is in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 17, the birth of John the Baptist foretold. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were, they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your life, wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Our second reading is in uh, Micah chapter 7 and verse 7. But as for me, I watch and hope for Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Thank you, everybody. Be uh, safe, happy holidays, and remain vigilant. Well, Mark, thank you for reading scripture for us. What a beautiful tree. Oh, it just looks so nice over at your place. Thanks for sharing that with us. You and Patty did a great job on the Christmas tree, and uh, we appreciate you reading scripture. We're here at the first Sunday of Advent, and we remind ourselves every year as we start out into Advent what this is really all about. The, the word Advent means arrival or coming. It's about the coming of Christmas, uh, and it comes from the word Adventus, which is a Latin word. And it's actually the word that's used uh, in translation for a very important New Testament word, and that's the Greek word parousia, parousia, the coming of Christ. And as we reflect on this year and, and come into Advent, oh, how we have yearned for the coming of Christmas this year. I, I don't know if you've observed the same thing, but you know, in the midst of a year that has been so unfamiliar, we find ourselves reaching for the familiar comfort of Christmas. The lights are up, the house is decorated, the tree is trimmed, the sound of Christmas music is floating through your living room. We are ready. This year, we're, we're even a little bit early. We are ready for Christmas. And I'm so glad that you've joined us here as we start out into the season of Advent. Over the next four weeks, we're gonna be studying scripture from the Christmas story and really intentionally connecting it to some of the major themes and things that we've experienced this year. Uh, some of the, the very things that we have been wrestling with through 2020. So for the next four Sundays, we're going to look at waiting, fear, division, and mercy. And this first Sunday, our theme is waiting. I cannot think of a year when we have had to practice waiting as much as this year. Perhaps my grandparents' generation that uh, lived through the Depression and World War II, perhaps they remember times such as these. But for most of us, this has been the most difficult and demanding year of our lives. And we just can't wait for it to be over. We're waiting for life to go back to normal. We're waiting for normal school days and normal holidays. We're waiting for normal sports seasons and normal dinners out. We're waiting for normal work routines and normal trips to the store. We're waiting for normal get-togethers with our family and friends. 
I have gotten so used to wearing a mask that guess what happened to me one day this fall? I'd been out running errands and uh, was coming back home. And you know how it is probably in your car too, like in the center console area, we have a stash of masks for when we're out and about. So it's just about become automatic. You know, you, you pull into your parking spot at a store or wherever it is, you grab your mask and you head on in. And here's what happened. I came home after having run a couple errands and I pull into my own driveway and park the car and put my mask on to go inside into my own house. That is not normal. Oh, how we long for this to be over. This fall, they started to write about something that they call pandemic fatigue. Uh, we're tired of it. And, and now the weather is turning and we're gonna be even more cooped up inside. The daylight hours are shorter. And we're at the start of what could be a long, dark winter. Today, we're gonna to talk about waiting something we've been doing for most of this year. And we're not here to commiserate about it, but we're here to look and see what the Bible says to us about waiting. Because waiting is very much how the Christmas story begins in Scripture. The Old Testament is building toward this moment of the coming promised Messiah. And then it, it finishes in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And then we have 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New, a time when no scripture is being written, no prophetic word is being spoken. It's, it's as if God has gone radio silent and the people are, are waiting. And not just for one year, but for 400 years, they're waiting on God. 400 years is 16 generations of people. I mean, most of us don't even know the names beyond four generations in our family tree. 400 years is a long time. When I mean, you think about 400 years uh, backwards from now, 1620, the Mayflower was just arriving. Uh, Shakespeare had just died. Isaac Newton hadn't even been born yet. And there was a guy named Galileo who for the first time ever was pointing a telescope up into the sky, trying to figure some things out. 400 years is a long time. And that's how long the people of God had just been waiting. When will God speak again? When will this Messiah finally come? Well, we flip then to the New Testament and we cue the angel Gabriel. I should say God cues the angel Gabriel. The time had finally come and God sends his angel to deliver a message to an old priest in Israel named Zechariah. Interestingly, Zechariah's name means the Lord has remembered. Uh, he had not forgotten, you know, 400 years of waiting, but the Lord had always remembered his people. And so we're introduced to Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. And, and this is a couple who's been waiting a, a long time in their own lives, specifically for the ability to have a child. And if you have endured uh, the struggle of infertility, you know how long and painful that wait can be. And the text says to us that by this time, they were both very old, it says in Luke 1, 7. So the, the window where this would even be possible for them to have a child is, humanly speaking, beginning to close or, or maybe already has. But as the refrain of scripture goes, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And God is orchestrating the events of this story. Zechariah is chosen by lot, by, by chance, right? To enter the inner sanctuary and to, uh, to offer the, the incense uh, for the evening prayers. This was a privilege that was so rare among the, you know, the vast group of people that are serving as priests that many priests would have never even had this privilege in their lifetime. But the lot falls to Zechariah, and he goes into the inner sanctuary, during which it was the custom then for people to gather outside and to pray. And it's while he's there in the sanctuary that the angel Gabriel appears. After 400 years of waiting, the angel appears and says, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. And don't miss that statement by the angel. Uh, they'd been waiting for a baby for a long, long time, but apparently 
they hadn't stopped praying about it. The angel said, Zachariah, your prayer has been heard. The, the preacher Charles Spurgeon said once, anything is a blessing which makes us pray. And this old couple had had reason to pray. The angel says to Zachariah, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And thus begins the Christmas story. After 400 years of silence, God speaks into the lives of a godly old couple, and he gives them a child. And this son of theirs, John, it says, will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You see, waiting is a time for preparing. And in the second half of the message, we're going to answer these four questions. What is waiting? What are we waiting for? How should we be waiting? And what is God doing while we're waiting? The Bible speaks to each of these four questions, and it speaks directly into the challenges that you and I are facing in 2020. But more importantly, it speaks of the waiting that we will still be doing when this pandemic has long since passed. So our first question, what is waiting? I remember in seventh grade history class, uh, the first day of class, Mr. Benarowski had us work in pairs for a few minutes, and we had to answer this question, what is history? And I remember thinking to myself, that is the most boring question I have ever heard in my life. You know, coming up with a defini definition of history, what a drag. I thought, let's just get right into the stories. I like the stories. But I tell you what, I never forgot the lesson that day in class. Definitions are important. So let's define it. Let's define waiting. The first thing about waiting that we would say is waiting is hard by its very nature. Otherwise, you have to ask yourself, is it really actually waiting? Uh, when I was in elementary school, there was a Christmas Eve when I made some very unfortunate choices. You see, at my house growing up, we would have our gift opening as a family on Christmas Eve. It would happen after supper and before we would uh, go to church for the seven o'clock Christmas Eve service. And, and, and then we could come home from church and we would set out our stockings and get the cookies and milk ready for Santa. And so when Santa would come then uh, Christmas Eve that night, that was like the big finale of the Christmas gifts in our house. So we'd wake up Christmas morning, and then the whole family would gather around and we would open up those last gifts and the stockings. Well, that night I woke up in the middle of the night and I started to wonder to myself, I, I wonder if Santa has already come. And so I crept downstairs as quietly as I could in the dark and I, I went into the, into the living room and sure enough, he had come. But that is then when things went south for me. I saw my gifts there. I saw the stocking full and, and the gifts that were wrapped and waiting for me. And, and I thought, I, I just can't possibly wait until morning to open these things. And, and just like the Grinch, that's when I got a wonderful, awful idea. And I went and I got my little pocket knife. And they're still in the dark of the living room. I slit open where the scotch tape was every single one of those gifts and I completely unpacked my stocking. I had everything laid out before me to examine and then I packaged it all back up and put the tape back over and restuffed my stocking so that no one would ever know. I couldn't wait. It was too hard. But you know what was even harder? Having to act surprised the next morning in front of my parents when I opened back up all those gifts that I had seen just a few hours earlier. It, it really wasn't fun. I tell you what, I mean, I didn't even need to get in trouble for it. I had learned my lesson and I never pulled that stunt again. Waiting is hard because when you're truly waiting, there's something out there that you really want that you just don't have right now. Secondly, as we define waiting, I would say waiting is active. Waiting in the Bible is not this passive thing like waiting at the drive-thru or waiting to, on the phone to make an appointment or to finally get through to customer service. You know, one of the great tragedies of this year would be if, if we're just waiting to get it over with. 
And I love the example in scripture of David in 2 Samuel 5, where he finds himself waiting in this very difficult situation. He had just been appointed king. And then the Philistine army, the, the enemy army, came and spread out across the valley. They didn't attack. They just put themselves into position. And David is left waiting. He's a new king. What is he going to do? It says in verse 19, so David inquired of the Lord. And that is what I mean by active waiting. David inquired of the Lord and he said to him, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And as he inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him. Waiting is hard. It's active. And it's ultimately about trust. That's the third thing. So, so when you study passages about waiting on the Lord, you inevitably are reading passages that are about trust. Let's look at Psalm 33 as one example. Look at how waiting is a test of strength in who you trust. Verse 16. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not rescued by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory nor does it rescue anyone by its great strength. So, th so that's the setup. And now look at verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your favor, Lord, be upon us just as we have waited for you. Waiting is about trusting. And the waiting that we have done in 2020 has revealed a whole lot about who we are trusting. So all good and proper measures aside in a pandemic, we have to ask ourselves, are we waiting just for a vaccine? Is that what this is about? Are we waiting for a government? Are we waiting for economic recovery? Or are we waiting on the living God who holds heaven and earth in his hands? Waiting is an act of trust, and where you put your trust will determine how you wait. So now that we've established that definition, what waiting is, number two, the second question, what are we waiting for? Well, maybe the most obvious thing that we're waiting for is, is for God's help, right? For his intervention. Think about the things in your life that you are waiting for right now this pandemic to be over, the healing of a loved one, to see and to hug your family again, uh, to be able to go back to school. These are all situations where we just don't have control over what's going on. And so we're crying out to God and we're saying, essentially, help, I'm stuck. We're waiting for God to intervene. And ultimately, we're waiting for that in waiting for his salvation. That's the culmination of it. The 400 years, the entire Old Testament before that, since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, we have been saying, help God, we're stuck. And all through the Old Testament, God is answering us and he is saying, I know, I'm coming. And then we get to Advent. And in his time, in his way, God came on Christmas, and he came for the cross to help, to heal, and to save. Hebrews 9 says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring, here it is, salvation to those who are waiting for him, which leads us to his return. And that's really the great parousia of the New Testament, the last advent. The German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, through all the advents of our life that we celebrate runs the longing for the last advent. When the word will be, he's quoting Revelation, see, I am making all things new. That's the reminder of 2020, isn't it? We have always been waiting Maybe we just forgot. You know, in normal times, we can live as if we have already arrived and, and this is all that we're living for. But when the rug gets pulled out from under you like it has this year, then we remember this, this can't be it. 
They say the enemy of waiting is forgetfulness. Psalm 106 says, but they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. I encourage you this Advent to remember what he has done and to be a person who waits for his plan. So how do we do that? How do we wait for his plan? How should we be waiting? How do you wait well? These are questions that the Bible clearly answers, and I'd like to sum it up for us in three adjectives. First, the Bible says that we're to wait patiently. Psalm 40, which you two famously put to song, says, I waited patiently for the Lord. But, but patiently doesn't mean it's not persistent. Uh, remember, waiting in the Bible isn't passive. And so we see Jesus telling this parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18. And the opening verse of that parable, it says he tells this to his disciples to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And so it is in this long season of waiting in 2020, we will wait patiently for the Lord and we will not give up. Secondly, second adjective, we are to wait expectantly. My son, who is eight years old, told me already back in October, he said, Dad, uh, the Christmas joy is starting to fill me up. <laughs> he was dead serious. He says, Dad, it's it's already up to my knees and that the Christmas joy just keeps growing every day. And it was not surprising to me because this is the kid after all who sings all year round. Uh, he sings himself to sleep by singing God rest you merry gentlemen and jingle bells. Those are his two favorite songs. So do you remember though what it's like to be eight or what it's like to wait expectantly for something? In Paul's letters, he uses the word eagerly. It's the word that he uses. In Romans, we wait eagerly for our adoption and the redemption of our bodies. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. There is a confident expectation in our waiting, like, like running out to the mailbox because, because you know that any day that package is finally going to arrive. Or, or, or like you're waiting for a letter. You've been expecting it, and it just might be in there today. That's how we want to wait on the Lord. He's coming and we wait expectantly. The third adjective then is, is that we're to wait faithfully. You remember how Zachariah and Elizabeth were described uh, other than being very old, which it said. Verse six, it says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They modeled what it looks like for us to wait faithfully. They were, they were obedient in the things of God. They remind me of a scripture in Isaiah 26 where it says, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. The word obedience, you know, can have mixed connotations. It's not really, for most of us, a warm, fuzzy kind of word. You know, you send a, a dog to obedience school. But in the Bible, there is such joy and freedom in obedience. It is never a bad day to be obedient to the Lord. And as 2020 draws to a close, may we be obedient and faithful. Isaiah 26 says, a people who are learning righteousness. That's how we want to wait. Patiently, expectantly, and faithfully. And that brings us to our last question for the day. And that is, what is God doing while we're waiting? And I think that's probably the biggest, most important question of all. It's one that the psalm writers and, the, and Bible characters often wrestled with, asking, God, where are you? What, what are you doing in this? God, why have you been silent for 400 years? God, why are you waiting when I'm stuck and I need help? What is God doing while we're waiting? And of course, we wrestle with those questions because we don't have all the answers. Waiting by its nature is hard. But there are certain things that God has said that get right to the heart of the matter. And I pray that you would know these truths in the deepest fiber of your being. First, God says that he hears you. He hears you. 
Micah 7. This was our second scripture reading. Israel is getting destroyed. Judah is paying tribute to survive. The people have forgotten God. And Micah says in that moment, he says, but as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. And Psalm 40, let's finish that verse we started earlier. I waited patiently for the Lord. And then it says, he turned to me and heard my cry. Do you think that God has heard your cry this year? Have you wondered about that? Let me tell you without a shadow of a doubt, he has. He hears you right now. Those 400 years of silence weren't really silent. God had heard every cry of his people. He hears you now. Not only does he hear you, but secondly, Scripture says that God sees you. Remember Psalm 33? That was the, the test of strength, the king, the warrior, the horse. What is their strength, it asks? Verse 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his faithfulness. His eye is on you right now. He sees you right where you're at. And I've got this old song ringing through my ears. When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches over me. He hears, he sees, and lastly, he acts. One last scripture passage I want to share with you today is Isaiah 64, as we have surveyed this theme of waiting. Isaiah 64, listen to this carefully. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Probably the single most important thing that you could hear today is that God is working in your waiting. He has not abandoned you. He has not walked away. 2020 is not a lost year. It's been a year of waiting. The Hebrew word there in Isaiah is the word shaka. But it doesn't mean just waiting. This word is a, is a deeper sense of, of adhering to something, to trust. And, and then listen to this. The root of shaka actually means to pierce. To pierce. It's as if the Bible already knew that waiting, really, really waiting, can also be painful. For 400 years and more, they had waited. And then when he arrived, when God finally arrived, they crucified him and pierced his side. And yet in the pain, the very plans of God since all eternity were unfolding. That by his death, we would have life. That by his wounds, we would be healed. He hears, he sees, he acts even in your waiting. My brothers and sisters, 2020 is about to draw to a close. You've got one month left. One more month of waiting. I kind of want to encourage you to use it wisely and to place all of your trust in the God who is worth waiting for. Let's pray. Lord, we echo the words that you have given to us already in Scripture. Lord, when we read your word, it's as if we find our own voice in the words that our, our heart has been longing to say to you. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. Your name and your renown are the desire of our hearts. And so, Lord, 
we say yes to this, yes to this word, that we will wait for you and we will have nothing less. We thank you for hearing us, seeing us, and taking action for us. Lord, you know that we are stuck and we're struggling. And we place all of our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing one more song and then I'll be back to finish our service. It's so wonderful to sing these Christmas songs now, which, which remember are, are really worship songs. And um, as we sing familiar songs, we also 
want to turn to a familiar prayer. And this is a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as they were following him and learning from him. And so we join our voices and, and pray these words today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, one of the passages, there's so many about waiting on the Lord that uh, we didn't get to, is one in Isaiah that says, blessed are all those who wait on him. Uh, and, and there is blessing in waiting. And so we want to share this closing blessing over you now um, as we begin the season of Advent, as we continue to make our way here through 2020 and into the new year. Uh, would you receive these words of blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. And may he give you his peace. Amen. It's so good to be with you as we head into Advent. Uh, we'd love to see you again next week. Remember, it's online-only worship for the rest of the year. And so we'll be here every Sunday morning at 930, and we'll pick up a new Advent theme next week for the second Sunday in Advent. Until then, keep in touch. Uh, God bless you, and we'll see you again next Sunday.